is Nui resigning. Yeah. Never thought that bombshell would happen soon do you enough. Think, do you think it was Horner's fault? Like, like people are talking about this toxic environment. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of Suited and Booted, the Formula One podcast. My name is Daniel Woodruff and with me in the studio is... Jasmine Jafar. And only Jasmine Jafar because Ron Tan is... Well, he's not here, where is he? He missed his flight. <laughs> he missed his flight, that's for sure. No, no, no. He's in Thailand for uh, his Aston Martin duties for GT World Challenge. Fair enough. Okay, that's, that's excusable. You were with him as well, right? Yes, yes. We were over the weekend for... Uh, Thailand Super Series, the mm-hmm. GT Championship over there. Uh, we ran a GT4 team, so it was pretty exciting. We won on, on our debut, so it was pretty Well cool. done. Uh, you were in a Mercedes, right? Yeah, I wasn't driving, so I was over overlooking the team and running the, the, the car setups and the, well, the you performance guys set. Yeah, <laughs> we tried to, we tried to. But we, we had a, two solid drivers, uh, Pro-Am, uh, you know, young up-and-coming talent, Hayden, um, and a very experienced Peter Hackett from Australia. Awesome. So it looks like we were all racing. I mean, I caught up with you on the train back that's from right. the airport yesterday. So that's if right. you look exhausted, that's why. So Ron's been racing in Thailand. He's racing in Thailand again this weekend, running the team. You just came back from Thailand. I was in Japan and got back last night as well, running a team there. Honestly, though, like it explains why we have so many Japanese F1 drivers. Out of all the Asians, they are unreal. Yeah. I was watching the kart racing all weekend hands down the best racing i've ever seen in my life and it was just another race weekend for them yeah you were telling me about the culture right the whole um passionate racing um environment that they do and and yeah it beats all the asian countries all around best overtakes super aggressive super fast paced and these people like dedicate their lives to it and like the grids were so big that there were elimination rounds so some people didn't even make the final (sighs) we never see that anywhere this part of yeah 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 so Anyway, uh, a lot of racing, so that's very, very exciting. But we just wrapped up the Miami Grand Prix. Um, I want to be honest, I didn't watch it live. I don't watch any of the American races live. It just, it was like 5 a.m. for us, 4, yeah, 5 a.m. Uh, it's tough. And the build-up is long, don't you think, Dan, with the pre-grid and the celebrities and the, um, you know, the, the, the recent rumors and the move-arounds and the, yeah. the bombshell. So... It takes a lot of time until the actual race, which is 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. So I mean, they're, they're trying to make it more and more like a circus. Well, I mean, like like NFL, you know, like I remember a few years ago when they introduced the first, uh, it was like that little uh, entry thing for one of the American Grand Prix. And it was like, you know, the the football players coming on and they break through the, 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 the tarp. Do you think the show's necessary? Do you even watch it? Uh... I did actually last year because um, okay, it was. Well, first... you just you're ruining my point here. <laughs> <laughs> I did because I was curious to see what it's all about. I mean, liberty is always trying to break boundaries, right? Yeah. So, um, I mean, we've been in motorsport such a long time, and all these add-ons are just you know add-on work, right? But maybe the American fans love it, you know. Maybe that attracts the the sponsors that comes with it instead of the actual racing. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. I mean, the grandstands did look packed. And we are getting more and more American sponsors. I mean, HP is American, right? Yeah. A false claim here. I think so, yeah. <laughs> and they, they're now the title sponsor for Ferrari. Yeah, yeah. So it's been a while, huh, Dan? I mean, it was a dominance of cigarette sponsorship and then Marlboro. to, yeah, Scuderia Ferrari Marlboro. I mean, that was iconic during the Schumacher era. Um, and then to some telcos, there was Vodafone that came on board. Mm, yeah. With, with uh, McLaren and, and Ferrari at the time as well. And AT&T was with Williams. Um, and then it shifted, right? It shifted um, to uh, now tech companies, right? You have um, Oracle with Google. Google. You have Google and McLaren. You have um, HP. You know, crypto companies. Crypto companies, correct. You know, FTX before they've gone bust. Yeah, we were going to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're, you know, you see the shift of where the actual sponsorship, the actual money is, and it's American companies. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're familiar with with sponsorship. I I guess we we all are on this show, right? Like, having been racing drivers, the biggest bane of our life is trying to get sponsors. And I don't think there's any country out there like America that 
will so liberally hand out sponsorship money. Like they really see the value. Malaysian companies, I mean, you're pretty much limited to sports ministry or Petronas and there's no one else that really stands out. Uh, maybe there was a, a gambling company when Alex Jung was was racing and that's about it. Mm. Um, and it's tough for smaller Asian countries to to sponsor, right? But America, they're just, they know the value of sports. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think um, it's a need and a must to 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 do sports development. You know, it's from, uh, you know, if it's, if it's football, it's from college football right up to, yeah. you know, the NFL, right? And they do the draft day and the, you know, all of that is commercial value because it's broadcasted live, right? Yeah. Uh, I think the true value of Formula One is it's only, it's only 10 teams, right? So um, now uh, there's so many stickers you can put in the car, right? And... Uh, I see the sense of sponsors wanting to be part of it because you know they know there's limited spaces on the car left, unless you want to do a deal with Williams or Haas, you know. Um, but I think the technology of the front end teams bring what they truly need. You know, it's it's all fast based and they're all going through AI and um, yeah, it brings it brings so much um, value and platform. Uh, you know investing in these f1 teams you know I, I wrote down a question here on my notes i was like do we do we need this many american races right we've got miami vegas texas yeah three is this those three yeah, yeah it is three. those three and in my head i was kind of like are there too many american races you know i mean like particularly for fans like like us where it's just kind of like ugh, it's the american flashiness and it's all that pre-show preamble and it's I, I really don't like the tracks. Maybe Circuit of Americas in um, Texas is good because that's a normal circuit. I am not a big fan of the street circuits that we're seeing in Formula One nowadays. So I'm kind of like, ah, oh, do we need to have so many? But to your point, maybe it is necessary because of the sponsors. Yeah, and and they choose the um, the glamorous location, right? It's yeah. Vegas. It's Miami. Okay, Texas was you know uh, everyone was a bit skeptical in the beginning, but you know, all the drivers are raving about it, the build-up over the weekend. It's just how the Americans run the, the show. Yeah. yeah, and you get America from east to west. Yes, exactly, exactly. And um, I think there's also talks about, uh, you know, having three in China. or mm. Now there's three in the Emirates, right? So there's, you know, uh, one in uh, Abu Dhabi, and then there's Saudi. Saudi, there's Bahrain. Yeah. Um, there's three there as well. So how do they level everything out, you know, between... Um, how they do in the states and how they do it in the uh, in the west. So so it's it's a balance. It's a balance for 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 viewerships. You just go where the money is. To be honest. Uh, to be honest, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they have to go to Saudi now because of Iron Core, right? Yeah, so, yeah exactly. Uh, but you got to go to the states because you have HP and uh, Google and etc. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> I mean, look, frankly, I don't I don't really care where they go. I just want good racing and I want good tracks. Um, and we'll talk about the Miami circuit a little bit later. Um, but I just. Until they decide to make circuits, sorry, make the cars lighter and smaller, street circuits do not work with these cars. Yeah. They're too heavy. They're too downforce reliant. It's just, they're, they're too big. They're too wide. It, it's just too, too difficult. It defeats the purpose. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's a high, um, high downforce uh, race cars, right? It's high downforce meant for, I don't know, high downforce tracks, right? Yeah. If you're doing 60Ks in a hairpin or chicane, it defeats the whole racing purpose of, yeah. of, of Formula 1. And I mean, I'm not hating on just the new circuits. Like, I think that these cars are too big for Monaco. I love Monaco. Everybody loves Monaco, right? But I love Monaco when you're in a 2004 V12, you know, Renault with Fernando Alonso skating through on Michelin tires, uh, trying to, you know, make his way up to the front, not big fat cars that are just going to be single file the whole time and even if you try to get into the hairpin it's like i don't even know if i'm going to make it around this corner yeah so it's true i don't know a bit of a, i think as you say it's a balancing act not just with viewership not just with money but also with raceability um but again we'll talk about the miami circuit in a little bit um before we get into the miami gp there's quite a lot of talking points we need to get through because there was a bit of a gap with the last race which was in shanghai so we've gone completely to the other side of the world um and that was what two weeks ago two weeks right? ago yeah. so a lot of stuff has happened in the news and it's a bit old so i'm sorry if you guys are listening to this now um you've definitely heard about the news i think the most important one um that leaves a lot of room for speculation open is Nui resigning yeah 
Never thought that bombshell would happen soon do you enough. Think, do you think it was Horner's fault? Like, like people are talking about this toxic environment that Horner's kind of facilitating. And obviously, he's been in the news cycle the whole season. I mean, with that whole harassment case with um, that uh, female colleague of his... And I just feel like it's snowballed from there. So do you think it's linked or was he going to leave anyway? Uh, I don't know what you think, Dan, but my thoughts is it's hard to pinpoint exactly on one person or one item in the team. Um, but I think a major factor that um, concluded this partnership is um, is the major shakeup in the whole organization, you know, um, mm. You know, ever since Mateshitz died, the leadership of his, uh, the, the heir, which is his son. Yeah, his kids, yeah. Um, we spoke about, you know, um, how he split the, the organization into three CEOs uh, in charge of different departments. But um, Oliver came to uh, one of the races earlier to have a chat of the structure of the team. And the team also has ownership within the within the Thai family. So, um who's the actual driver of the team of course you have your team principal uh you know your your designers your drivers it's, it's a championship winning team but who are the people behind it you know the are the shareholders really um as motivated now the facts that that, that matter shit is gone are they uh, you know they, they've got a big partnership with Ford coming up with Jim Farley right um and is that really the route they take because Ford did send a public statement about you got to sort the team out. like Yeah, particularly after the whole Horner thing. After the whole yeah. Horner thing. So, you know, judging from the outside, you know, they, they're very tight-lipped, but the whole organization within Red Bull, uh, you know, the shareholders and the directors, who is actually steering the ship? Because um, if one cookie crumbles, the whole team falls apart, right? We've, yeah. seen, we've seen this before. So, um, you know, we've seen it at Ferrari when, when you know, Braun left for... Honda and, and Jean thought retired and went to the FIA and etc. So, and then the cookies start to start crumble because there's no actual driver or, or, or um, you know, the, the leader. Yeah, you need a strong, strong single leader to guide everyone. Correct, correct. Yeah. You know, despite of having Honda and, and, and his team, there was matterships behind it and everyone knew that he was calling the shots at the end of the day. So Yeah, I think it's just a perfect storm, to be honest, because also knew he's been there for so long. Right, nineteen years. At, at what point do you decide one last challenge to go somewhere else, which opens up the bit about speculation? Where do you think he's going to go? I mean, uh, there's four teams apparently across yeah. the grid. We got Ferrari. Uh, there's Ferrari. Yeah. Apparently, um, Vasso had a meeting with New in, in London with mm-hmm. with uh, Newey. Uh, there was photos of Toto sitting down with Newey. Of course, okay, so Mercedes, Ferrari, Mercedes. Um, big bombshell with Aston with a blank check, but mm-hmm. um, apparently lately Aston, uh, it may not be the route. And one more might be Audi. Yeah, well, I, and I saw James Valls was talking about trying to poach him as well. Yeah, but there was a good analysis on, on uh, Martin Brundle over the weekend, over the week. Despite having the one person, Newey, you have to have the resources below him mm. because he, if he's going to design something super sophisticated and it's going to cost a lot of money and you can't, you can't deliver it, then what's the point of him being there, right? Which eliminates uh, Williams Correct. from being on the list because he's just be working on an Excel spreadsheet the whole time. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's the same like Paddy Lowe when he was supremely successful in, in, in Mercedes, went to Williams and he's so limited, he... He can't do anything, yeah. You know, and 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 the team, uh, the team had a stream of no points. So, uh, no, no, no discredit to Paddy. I mean, he's super successful in Formula One, but that doesn't mean he's not he's not good, right? So, yeah. so having Newey, you need to have this team of you know, team and resources to to deliver for him. Yeah, I think Ferrari though. I think Ferrari. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, like they have the resources. They literally have like an unlimited budget. I know, I know, F one puts a budget cap on team spending per year, but Ferrari has an unlimited budget. Yeah, you know, and That's they've done true. it for so long, and now they have Fred, and as we've seen with the driver lineup as well, Fred has that star power. Yeah, he is that single point of strength. And he's just such a cool guy. I mean, he was even celebrating with Norris. Did yeah, you see that? It's cool, huh? Yeah, and he put on a McLaren cap. They threw a McLaren cap and he was in the crowd. He put it on and then he had a bottle of champagne. He waited for Norris and he sprayed him. And that's just so good to see. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not yeah. that like, 
us versus you. He, he just actually seems like a nice guy. Don't you think the drivers are also playing with the media, hinting to the bosses? A hundred percent. Yeah, they, they look like they, they all won him. All the Ferrari uh, drivers, uh, Mercedes drivers, true. everyone is, is dropping a hint being yeah. like, we want him. Yeah. 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 But which, you know, when one person does it, you kind of think, okay, they're about to announce something and it's a bit confirmed. But now everybody's doing it. It's kind of like they're all just messing with each other. Yeah, true. true so, true, true. but bet's, bet's still on, on Ferrari. Um, speaking of other teams, there's also uh, a bit of gossip about Alpine potentially selling their shares in the team. Yeah, I mean, there was a, f- a first chunk already to, uh, I think last year it was Ryan Gosling and... and Ryan Reynolds. Uh, Ryan Reynolds, sorry. Yeah. Ryan Gosling. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, with a team of consortiums, I think they're entering the sports entertainment world. Yeah, because um, they, bought a, they bought a football team as well, right? right? And now they're just hedging yeah, themselves hedging across themselves. different sports. Correct. But why Alpine though, I wonder. But anyway. Um, good deal. Good deal, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is showing signs that they might leave the sport then, I think. I don't know what you think. I mean, they, they've had a good run, right? I mean, Alpine can trace its... Uh, well, I wouldn't even say its roots. I mean, I don't even think Renault 2004 was a start. They go even further than that. Yeah. I mean, they, they have been involved in the sport for decades. Mm. You know, partnerships even with the whole Prost era when Prost had his own team. They've been around for so, so long. Um even if they were to leave, I would give it five to ten years before they, they actually come back. Yeah. Um, but it is understandable. I mean, at what point do you stop burning money and throwing money into this That's endless true. pit? Because they've invested so much to be a midfield team that is now more of a back barker team. Yeah. Right. Last championship they won was the Alonso era. Then they had Raikkonen. They couldn't convert really with that. Maybe they had one or two podiums, maybe a win or there. I can't really remember. They had Grosjean, they had a French driver. Now they still have two French driver lineups. In terms of the commercial aspect, I don't, you know, you think that a French team with two French drivers would be this like mega collab. But even in terms of the commercial aspect, it just doesn't seem to carry as much weight as, say, what Ferrari's doing, you know, with two non Italian drivers it's or, true. or anyone else. So it's a similar conversation I think Aston would have had with um, Lawrence Stroll. But Stroll is lucky that, and I'm talking about the father, the father is lucky that I think his investments are starting to pay dividends because he's poached so many people, Yep. right? I think Alpine has played too much of a long game with no results. Mm. So, mm. I don't it, know. It's how, it's, how they, they, it's how they build their foundations, but their foundations are not matured over the years, I think. Yeah. yeah. And, and Alpine or Renault, well... Alpine isn't Renault, right? Are they? Alpine I, 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 is Renault. I mean, they, they Alpine are, is the sports car division of of Renault now. They they are government linked. Right? They are, Renault yeah, is a yeah. French government, government linked, linked yeah. company. Right? Yeah, right. So I guess the question also comes up of with the global economy going the way it is now, you are in essence to a degree spending taxpayer money for, for a yeah. B, B grade team. team that's yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, okay, fair. Bye bye Alpine. Bye bye. <laughs> Shakes them. Um, and last bit of off track gossip before we get into the Grand Prix. Andretti confident, confident about 2026 entering the sport. I know they were, in essence, rejected from entering the grid next year. Uh, do you think that's going to happen? I saw the um, photos of the new facility. Beautiful. Beautiful facility Huge. in Silverstone, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, They've got a few programs ongoing, Dan. Uh, they're doing IndyCar. Oh, they're in so many right, championships. Yeah, uh, what, Wayne Taylor Racing in um, IMSA. Mm. Um, bits and pieces everywhere, right? And there's a huge rumor of them coming to WEC. Uh, I think that base in the UK is imminent, but there must be a big purpose, right? Which mm. is Formula 1. And they looked like they had over 70 staff already. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, Force India or, or Racing Point at the time, they only had 300, so they're not far off, you know. And and I saw on, on certain um, uh, advertising on, on job placements in, in, mm-hmm. in Andretti. So, uh, Mario Andretti was on the grid and he's confident he'll be, they'll be on the grid in 2026. So, um, I don't know if that Cadillac partnership is still ongoing. Um but they seem very, very confident. Yeah. I mean, look, with the, with the number of championships that they're doing, they need a facility that big. I think one thing that people don't understand is that even teams that race in other championships like WEC, 
um, other GT championships. And then when you're in F2 as well, or Indy, as you mentioned, you need facilities that are as big as F1 teams. They do hire a buttload of people, Mm -hmm. right? So even if they do get rejected again, I think the facilities won't go to waste. But as you say, everything is ready. Mm -hmm. They do have the money. They do have the intent. Um, I know that Andretti was talking about uh, maybe filing a lawsuit or at least lodging a complaint about potential discrimination against their entry. He was basically saying there's discrimination against American teams coming into Formula One. Um, I don't know how true that is. I think it's just discrimination against wanting to dilute their um, cash prize distribution pool. Yeah. You know, the way it talks about like, Wolf not wanting yeah, other to, teams to take a part of that to pie. To share that pile, right? But Dan, you know, he says that or, or, or we've heard of that and and there we go about Toto announcing it's the first team to reach or to, to have a revenue of five hundred fifty million a year, right? Andretti. Yeah, no, Mercedes oh, right, Mercedes right, Grand right. Prix. So if a team is already financially sound and stable, of course they will want to protect their the prize winnings. But for the sake and the nature of the growth of the sport, um, it's nice to have such small teams with big dreams, you yeah. know. Well you should um, you should um Trademark that. That was really good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, you know, when when Toto started, right, he, he entered via HWA that ran the DTM team. He moved up the ladder with Williams and yeah. then he became a shareholder in Mercedes. So it's the same like Gene Haas, you know. Gene Haas was doing all his racing in America, etc. And there was an opening to have a team and, and now he's, he's a, having an F1 team. So I think Andretti is capable enough, right? Sure, for sure. They're capable enough. So it's a matter of votes. And I think out of 10 teams, maybe nine didn't put out their hand. <laughs> mm, yeah. yeah. Well, well, we'll wait and see. I mean, as as you say, uh, we have three American races, so I think it's only a matter of time. Um, but I think that's as much as we can speculate for now. <laughs> now, let's jump into the actual racing itself. Uh, I think, again, the beauty of this season so far, I don't think has been the on-track action. It has been all of the stuff happening outside during the silly season and it's only going to continue because there's still a lot of seats that haven't been confirmed but going into the miami grand prix it's a sprint weekend um again i'm not completely a fan but someone that is a fan is daniel ricardo because obviously it had allowed him to get back to his old ways first time on the second row or the top five in god knows how long p4 in quali and the sprint but an awful qualifying and meh race. So what do you think about that entire performance? He needed that fourth place to save his seat, oh, obviously. Yeah, sure. Or oh, no, do you think it's going to save his seat? Um, Was it enough? I don't think it's, it's enough, Dan. I, mean, yeah. yeah, I don't think it's enough. Do you think he'll stay on the rest of the season? <laughs> I don't think so. I think, I think with all of the big regulation changes coming in, all of the young talent that are rocking up at the weekend Antonelli is applying for a super license yeah. not to say that he's going to take a Red Bull seat or Alpha Tori seat right because he's not part of that junior program but I just think that the teams are getting ready to have a big shift that is why there's no you know there's a lot of uh, seats that haven't been confirmed for next year right yeah. Science, we still don't know where Science is going yeah. Audi's coming into the sport we know that they've taken Hulkenberg um, I think everybody's waiting for the best possible option and I think Ricardo is everybody's plan B right now. I think they're Red Bull's plan B, but I think they're wait, they're playing the long game because they want to see who else they can get. Mm. Um, you're talking about his sprint performance. I mean, fine. A P4 is a P4. It doesn't matter where it is. Like, all credit words due. But the really important bit is qualifying in the race, right? I don't give a toss about the sprint yeah. part of the weekend at all. Um and to go from all the way up at the front to all the way at the back. Meanwhile, your teammate Sonoda is once again consistently just doing so much with the car. Yeah. Right? Yep. And so for me, if I had the pick of Daniel Ricciardo or Sonoda, at this rate, I put Sonoda in the Red Bull car. Yeah, me because too. Because Perez is awful. I mean, he was going to be my Bennett again for this weekend. Just I, I can't get my head around why he's still there. I definitely think Perez is going to go as well. Mm, I never, I keep saying never to discredit Sonoda because yeah. he he has proven um, he's got good backing. 
um, even when Honda's uh, going to move over to Aston, um, Aston, you know, you should you should consider him. Uh, at the same time, for Daniel, um, I don't know what you noticed, Dan, but I noticed with his body language after uh, post race interviews and you know, you know, seeing him walking around the paddock, it's some excuses are starting to rise. You know, um, they need to. They keep saying uh, it needs to qualify better, but by being in the mid pack, it's hard to show our true pace. Uh, I can't overtake in Miami, etc., etc., etc. But when you see Sonoda, on the other hand, he goes, yeah, we maximised what we had. Uh, I felt the car felt good. We need to improve here and here, and, and I'm ready for the next race. So you see the sense of confidence and the um, uh, the, the level of uh, uh, performance he's, he's beginning to extract. And uh, the fact that he's done that a few races, he's not even looking at Daniel. He's looking at the cars ahead. You yeah. Know? So... Uh, and having Daniel as your teammate, Grand Prix race winner, highly, highly experienced. I don't think Sonoda is looking back anymore. He's, he's I think he's Sonoda really has less ready. pressure though. Yeah. Right? I, th- I think Sonoda's only pressure for keeping his seat was to crash less. Mm-hmm. Right? They got him his, his psychologist, his therapist or whatever. It was swear less in the car, be less of a hothead and finish the races, stop crashing. He's done all of that. He still swears and he's still a bit of a hothead, but so much better. He's matured so much. Whereas Ricardo, when he gets his questions from the media, he knows that it's with the tinge of, you used to be a race winner. You used to be a Red Bull driver. What's up, right? So he's he has to be a little bit defensive. Um, but I agree, he's on the back foot at this point. He's not good for his psychology. It's not good for his brand image. And he's getting old. I mean, how old is he again? Uh, old enough. Uh, old enough. Old enough. <laughs> I mean, Sonoda's still, like, he looks like a fetus. Yeah. Still, uh, still a baby. He's still in his mid late 20s, I think. Um, Sonoda. Uh, Sonoda, mid 20s? Yeah, I would say Sonoda's maybe like yeah. 27, yeah. 26, yeah. 26, yeah, 27. Yeah. Ricardo's 30. 34, maybe 35. Yeah. Uh, I were, We need to wait for that that new wave of, mm. of kid to come in. Yeah, true, yeah. true, true. So, I guess that's a prediction there. Um, so, not the best performance from him. I don't think it's going to help him in his contract signing that much. But what will help his contract signing for the future is Norris. Yeah. Mega, mega performance. I think this is one one of the few race winners where it's like everybody's just happy. Yeah. I'm smiling because I'm happy for him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, read, I read a stat somewhere. It's been 2,248 days since his last, uh, or last McLaren win, I think, since yeah. Anza, right? So... Uh, he executed well, but never to forget then, McLaren had one of the biggest upgrades um, compared to any other team. Mm. And they said um, it's equivalent to a B-spec car. Okay. So B-spec car meaning it's almost a brand new um, uh, uh, car. Uh, it didn't work in free practice, but they managed to, to pull it through in the race. But uh, yeah, very happy for Lando. I think it's a uh, it's well overdue and, and everyone was praising the fact that he, he beat Max Verstappen. I mean, and, and he beat Max fair and square, right? Because when you look at the safety car restart, I mean, Max almost got him at the restart. He defended well and then he legitimately pulled away, right? Usually this is where we just see Max like with the crazy top speed of Red Bull pass easily on the straight and then run away with it. But Norris genuinely held his own and pulled a gap. Yeah. So, I don't know uh, how much of it is is the driver, how much of it is the B-spec upgrade. I mean, Piastri's in the same car. Yep. Piastri coming out, where was he? Not very well. Yeah. <laughs> I've he, got the top 10 list here, and he's not on it. Yeah. So No, I think Piastri had a, had a good chance to at least be on the podium, uh, but the battles with Sign and he broke his front left wing. Uh, he had uh, a wing replacement, wing that's right. Wing replacement. Yeah. And then he kind of missed out in that whole safety car you know mm-hmm. uh, uh, drama at the time and uh they were prioritizing lando obviously for sure so so i think um oscar will come back strong um yeah then oscar's um report was he was so happy with the car despite uh everything that happened and they were happy with how the team progressed so i think mclaren is in a very good uphill uh trajectory so yeah so, yeah it's going to be good one driver that was unhappy was Sainz. He was basically saying if the safety car had come out at a slightly different time, like one lap or so, when he changed his his pit stop, he would have won the race instead. Yeah, it's true. But it's true. Yeah. That's racing, baby. Yeah, it's you true. know, there's some good battles despite having a 
a tight track. Um, yeah, I w- okay, I was surprised. I was surprised. I, I, again, I stand by what I said. I don't like a lot of the street tracks that are on the calendar, but it wasn't bad. Yeah, there's wheel-to-wheel actions. And, um, you know, despite uh, Perez, uh, you know, everyone was calling him a torpedo in turn one. Oh, my God. Just but he was saying the fact that the, mom- the, 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 the one meter you're off the, the racing line, there's no grip. Yeah, it's you dusty. Know? It's dusty. So, um, and obviously overnight, um, you know, it's not like a normal racetrack, right? So, I think to create that opportunity on a dusty track, wow, it's it's a bit of a, a challenge. You got to time it perfectly, yeah. right? He was trying. Yeah, yeah. And and there's good there's good overtaking, and even Lewis enjoyed the race over the weekend in Miami. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. I don't know. I I just feel like Lewis likes being in the states. He's kind of like Ricardo, right? That's Ricardo true. likes the Texan cowboy stuff. The whole yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah. You, you. <laughs> but you know, Hamilton's kind of like I like it because of the Met Gala. You know, I get to dress <laughs> up and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's okay. I mean, look, this is this is my kind of qualm with the whole thing. I I bash sprint races. I bash street circuits. But there's always occasionally that one Grand Prix where it's like, actually, it blew our expectations. And everyone in the media circus talks about how good it actually was. And they thought it, would, it would, like, wouldn't be. Credit where it's due, that's fine. But I think statistically, Miami is not an interesting race. Yeah. Right. So I think when selecting the calendar for future years, I think what they need to look at is let's not look at the one offs where there's a safety car that then jumbles it all up. Because if the safety car didn't happen, it would have been a boring max runaway. It would have been a lot more predictable. And then we would have had a different discussion. We would have said, Oh yeah, Miami was boring, the sprint was boring, blah 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 blah. So they got lucky with the safety yeah, car. Yeah, that's true. But that's true. I still think Miami shouldn't be there <laughs> you can have miami just please change the circuit into like a proper track into something else like i just i'm i've bashed street circuits enough on miami this, international this circuit That'd be yes, pretty exactly. cool. mic um they have long beach though uh they you know, do they do have long beach indycar and uh imsa but they're not grade no nah, they don't a, yeah fia circuits yeah right so f1 needs to be on a grade a fia circuit and yeah. i think the indycar ones are a bit more um yeah Cowboy. Dangerous. A bit more cowboy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you put it off, you're going <laughs> to yeah, destroy your car. Exactly. Um, let's talk about the incident that actually caused Lando to win. So the safety car came out, which allowed Lando to pip up into, f- to, into first. But that was caused by Magnuson and Sargent crashing. Now, there's a lot to unpack here about Magnuson. Um, during the race, I think it was definitely his fault, the crash with Sargent. He, was, he just sent it into the right-hander of the chicane. It wasn't going to work, so... Can we collectively agree that yeah. it was Magnuson's fault? Yeah. Now let's debate. So Magnuson has been in the media cycle a lot this weekend because in the sprint race as well, he was a bit of a swear word, right, on track. Yes. He was uh, extremely aggressive with his defending tactics going off the track multiple times. Um, and some people say that it was intentional, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. I think as racing drivers... We know that his moves were intentional. He was intentionally cutting the circuit. Because it let him pull a bigger gap, he missed the chicane, which meant that he could have more straight line speed on the following strain. True. I think True. I think fans that watch it that haven't driven a race car will say, you never know. He would maybe he locked up, went straight, you have to look at the telemetry. But we know, we know what he was doing. Yeah. Right. Now, Andrea Stella was basically saying in the in the news that what Magnuson did should be a bannable offense. Like he should literally have been banned from a race or DQ'd or something like that because it's not... He was basically saying going off the track three times doesn't equate to a five-second, five-second, five-second penalty. It doesn't yeah. equate to 15 seconds. It should be an exponential penalty, right? Yeah. So if you constantly mess up and do something that's unsportmanlike, yeah. it should reach a point where it's like, okay, five, 10-second penalty, and then the next third offense... You're you're packing your bags and going home because yeah. you're just being annoying on track. Sure, sure. So, do you think Magnuson should have been banned? Uh, that, okay, there's a fine line of this racing incident, don't you think, Dan? Um, we've seen drivers lunging, we've seen drivers, um, you know, creating opportunities but misjudge mm-hmm. other situation. I totally agree that the Kevin Magnuson incident is intentional because it was. I think he was frustrated and he's at the heat of the moment. What I don't understand is he knew he was quicker than Sergeant anyway, right? 
um, and he could have waited for, for another few laps to overtake him. Why the rush, right? Now, the question is whether it's bannable or not. Um, in a way, is how much the racing incident um, should be measured, right? Sometimes FIA say, oh, it's a five-second penalty or it's a 10-second penalty. But with those back-end teams, when you crash, it's costing them a lot of money. Yeah. And they're not in the points. You know, they don't have as much sponsors or resources. So um, there should be a certain, maybe not bannable, but there should be um, a very heavy slap on the wrist, you know, Um it's like us being in school, being told off by, by our school teachers, right? So the school teachers at the FIA should really reprimand uh, Kevin in one way or another um, to teach him a lesson because he's not someone who just arrived in Formula 1 yesterday. He's been around for a very long time and he's raced for a very long time. Um, and it's also unfair for Sergeant, but um, and Sergeant had a stream of crashes as well, but... Uh, it's it's cost and it's avoidable. So yeah. So uh, yeah. but but I'm also talking about the I- incident with Hamilton in mm. the in the sprint, basically mm. where he was going off. So not just the accident, but him intentionally going off the track again and again and again. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's intentional same. as well. Yeah, I would say that's the same. Okay. So um, if it's two actions in the same weekend, and a, a heavier slap on the wrist, right? So there needs to be a, a really strict measurement into this racing incident they call it yeah i i think it goes back to that whole discussion about the almost arbitrary nature of the penalties that the fia gives out right uh you know holding someone up and qualifying suddenly equates to like a 10 second penalty but then you hit someone off and then it's a five second or a three second yeah for someone else doing the exact same thing then they get a stop and go penalty yeah which is way worse yeah you know so i i agree that it's still hard to see consistency in the FIA rulings and the penalties. But with this incident, it happened multiple times, yep. right? And I mean, I was running a, a Japanese go-kart team over the weekend. And in Japan, it's no nonsense, right? In carts, you bump someone off once, there was some barging, immediately black and white flag, right? That That's the the, the control tower basically saying, we see you, you have a warning. You do it again in the same race, the next lap, black flag, straight away. You're out of the race, right? So I think there also has to be some of that black and white flag coming back into F1. Because it, it always says under investigation and all that kind of stuff or, you know, 80,000 euro fine. Okay, fine. It's a lot of money. But when your salary is 84 million euros <laughs> a year, what's 80,000? Yeah. You know, th- th- that is not a slap on the wrist. Yeah. Even uh, they're saying investigated after the race, like... Yeah. It's a bit late. Huh? I mean, they have all the resources and, you know, drivers towards to analyze it. Bang on. Just yeah, just issue, just the, issue, issue the, the penalty. Issue the penalty. Yeah. yeah. I, and again, like, I don't even think it should be a penalty. Like the stop and go, the five seconds, all that kind of stuff. Like with a lot of that stuff, five second penalty, if you pull enough of a gap, you can still reclaim it. You yeah. burn your tires a little bit more or you lose a couple of positions, but you still gain points in yeah. the race. But yeah. if you get a black flag for unsportsmanlike behavior... You're out of the race. It's yeah. zero, nada. Agreed. You know? Agreed. So, I don't know. I, it's good to watch maybe because it makes it a bit more interesting. But I think coming from a perspective of having one of our own drivers on track, I think it would really have annoyed me. Yeah. So, yeah. I kind of see where he's coming from. So, anyway, that wraps up the Miami Grand Prix. Uh, a bit more interesting than I thought it would be. Next race is going to be Imola, uh, Emilia Romagna. Um, May 17th to 19th. So that is well, a week and a bit away. Yep. Um, very, very good track. That's your kind of OG track as well. Yep. Uh, good for overtaking. I can't wait for that. Um, Ferrari and the Tifosi will be there. Uh, let's wrap up this episode with our win it or bin it. All right. I think this is going to be pretty easy. Uh, I'm not going to do a win it or bin it for the sprint and the race. I think let's just do overall, overall the weekend. Yep. Win it. Three, two, one. Norris. Norris. There we go. Okay. <laughs> now this one. Bin it. Three, two, one. Magnuson. Sergeant. <laughs> okay. I think there were a couple of people that binned it. I think Perez is always a key there. Yeah, true. Okay, why why Magnuson? Um obvious reasons. <laughs> no, no, he's you know, some weekends when he's on his high, he's superb, right? Yeah. He is a fast guy. He's a fast guy, one lap, you know, one lap uh, superhero. Um, but when he's down, uh, the car's not there and the environment's not there. 
he bends his whole weekend, right? Yeah, hot head. Hot head. And in even in his interview, his his body language was I need to rekindle myself. Yeah. He's, <laughs> he's kind of losing his, he's not the most marketable guy anymore as well, right? Uh, maybe he's gonna miss Nico Halkenberg. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me it was Sergeant. I think the crash wasn't his fault, but it's your home race and you're you were just un unspectacular the whole time. So yeah. Sergeant, I feel like you're going to be on the binet a lot more this season. It's, it's <laughs> Sergeant and uh, Perez. I think they're going to take the cake for binet for the rest of the season. Um, all right, that's it. Well, Imola next. Uh, we'll have Ron back in the studio with us when he's done gallivanting around uh, Thailand <laughs> with his racing team. Thank you so much for listening. Don't forget to uh, subscribe and leave five stars on all of the uh, various podcasting platforms you listen to us on. Spotify, Shock Podcasts, and apple podcasts uh don't forget to also write in all of your questions to us on social media on suited and booted pages or on our personal handles as well thank you so much for listening my name is daniel woodruff i'm jasmine jafar and that was suited and booted thank you and drive safe